This is Crash Course, a podcast about business, political, and social disruption, and what we can learn from it. I'm Tim O'Brien. Today's Crash Course, Donald Trump versus the Republican Party. This podcast, as I noted, is all about disruption. And I can't imagine a more disruptive politician than Donald Trump. After rolling down a Trump Tower escalator in 2015 to declare what became his first successful presidential bid, he proceeded to upend and warp political, civil, and legal norms. And he forced Americans to examine myths they've told themselves about tolerance, progress, and shared values and goals. This has spawned an array of disruptions and learning moments, including Trump's collision with the GOP, the Republican Party's collision with itself, and the ongoing polarization of Republicans and Democrats. All of that led to the recent cage match in Congress over who Republicans would nominate as the next Speaker of the House. Hand-wringing within the party over whether Trump can be a successful presidential standard-bearer in 2024, and who will be best situated to represent Democrats in that same race. We are in a chaotic political era, and the fact pattern and clarity are our friends in moments like this. That's why I'm happy to welcome Maggie Haberman to today's show. Maggie is a senior political correspondent with The New York Times, one of our savviest Trump watchers, and the author of a new bestseller, Confidence Man, The Making of Donald Trump and the Breaking of America. Hey, Mags. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me. I don't think we're going to have enough time to get through everything I want to talk to you about. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm startled by how many shared interests we have. But let's start off with the obvious, which is your book. It's a biography, of course, but it's also a reflection of the arc of your own journalistic career because you've been watching Trump for a long time, right? That's right. And what I tried to explain is sort of why I have a perspective that most of my colleagues who were covering him when he was president didn't have because I come from New York City. I have covered aspects of the real estate world. I covered City Hall. I covered state government. I covered various realms that Donald Trump, you know, either played in or touched on or was involved with over the course of his pre-presidency. And I tried to explore the themes of why so much of this presidency was pre-written in terms of how it was going to go. And it should have been clear even to people who were wishing that it was going to be some, to use your word, disruptive force that was going to ultimately sort of find its level. Donald Trump never found his level. It should have been clear why. Well, let me rephrase that. It would have been clear had people known his past, right? I mean, I think if every person who was talking about Trump as a candidate had read Trump Nation by Tim O'Brien, uh -huh. if everyone had read Trump, The Deals in the Downfall by Wayne Barrett, if everyone had read Gwenda Blair's book, which is a very sweeping biography, much different than mine. With deep detail about Fred Trump. Correct. Who's the great mentor and shaper of his son, Donald. And saver of his son, Donald, when Trump was falling at almost every turn while he was alive, and frankly, even long after. I think it would have been clear to people that, you know, sort of Trump had built this artifice as this successful, savvy businessman whose name was synonymous with wealth in the 1980s, and he used news stories to do that. And it was just so divorced from the reality of who he was. I keep thinking about the word, I've been thinking about the word a lot, disruptive. He's disruptive, but as you know better than anyone, with no end in mind a lot of the time. It's just chaos. There's chaos no strategy there. I think right. you and I have talked in the past about any time the word strategic comes up in a headline or a paragraph, it represents a certain unknowingness about how Donald Trump rolls. That's right. That's right. You mentioned earlier your time reporting in, in New York. You were a classic New York beat reporter covering local politics. That's how you first intersected with Trump. And then at the New York Times, they drop you onto the Trump beat at a time when the received wisdom, including my own, I might add, was that he had absolutely no chance of occupying the Oval Office. How did you feel about that assignment when you got it at the New York Times? So I sort of fell into it by happenstance because nobody wanted to cover him, you know, for, <laughs> for, the, for the reasons you just said, right? It was like, this is going nowhere. Why are we doing this? I will tell you, I was struck largely by 
how it wasn't just inflammatory, the things that he was saying, but dangerous, the things he was saying were. I wrote a big story in November 2015 with my colleague, Pat Healy, about Trump's demagoguery and the way he was using language to inflame people. And it was very clear the effect that his words were having on a group of people. So the way I felt about it was that it was important because I thought that even if he didn't have a huge chance by all of our calculations at that point, he still had a chance. And he, more importantly, had an effect. And so I thought it mattered. I mean, it is funny. I mean, I, I think I can say this, it's right where we are, but I remember being assigned to cover a billionaire running for office in 2001 in New York City and being annoyed. <laughs> what was that guy's name? That, that guy's name was Mike Bloomberg. <laughs> and I was, I was at the New York Post and I said, you're assigning me a guy who's not going to win. And this is just a waste of time. It's really important for reporters to remember that nothing is preordained. So... And that the world often humbles us and teaches us lessons. And the world often humbles us. And so to that end, you know, there were points, Tim, in the 2016 campaign where I thought Trump had a shot. I mean, I remember in 2015, in December, telling a colleague that we had to start preparing for the possibility he was going to win Iowa. He was still really up in the polls. And even though he was in a bit of a dogfight with Ben Carson and Ted Cruz was hanging in there. And then in, in May, again, when he clinched the nomination although he was still facing a battle from his party, there were clear signs that he had a potential path. And by September of 2016, I remember talking to a Democratic pollster whose work has generally really been very good, who was saying that Hillary Clinton was not polling with working class white voters in sort of the heartland the way she should be. And that was a blinking sign they were seeing that was worrying them. And so it's important to cover the race in front of you, not the one you assume that's happening or the one that happened before. You know, you went on in your coverage to amass what I think is a body of work that was singularly distinct, valuable to our society as a whole in terms of the fact pattern you laid down. You were part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize. Before we talk a little bit more about the book, I also want to address this idea that you're a water carrier for Donald Trump and his administration. You know, I've watched a lot of Trump coverage over the years, decades now, unfortunately. That's how old I am. I have never once thought that you carried water for Donald Trump. I think you have tried to navigate classic beat reporting, which means sometimes moving sources along a road so you can get to the truth of something, but never compromising ultimately what you wrote in a story to be objectively true to the best of your ability. But I'm probably defending you for you right now. So how do you feel when you get saddled with this idea that you're a water carrier? I mean, I, a, I appreciate you defending me. B, I think that people either don't understand reporting or don't understand I think particularly of Trump's political critics from the left who are sort of on the one hand, like, why aren't you going in and calling these people and screaming at them? But also, why aren't you getting this information that I want to tweet about and use? We generally don't call people and start yelling at them as a departure point, but we do have to engage with a lot of different people. Donald Trump's world, as you know better than anybody, has for a very long time been very unsavory means we end up around and talking to a lot of unsavory people who are often difficult people who are serial liars, right? Who are unreliable narrators, right? At best. And so we do the best we can. People are entitled at the end of the day to think what they want about the work and to have their own opinion. All I can say is I am the reporter who was mentioned the most in the Mueller report <laughs> whose work was, which is not a document Donald Trump liked. I'm the reporter who broke the news of what was in John Bolton's book during the impeachment trial, which almost forced witnesses in the Senate, which would have been a, a huge moment had that happened and would have been very hard for him, I think, to ultimately survive or at least to survive functionally going into 2020. So I'm confused by what in the coverage people think is uh, going easy on him. Water carrying. I think what the broader public doesn't understand about beat reporting, whether you're covering the intelligence community or M&A deals or Silicon Valley or Hollywood or anywhere there's power, is that there's this kind of basic challenge, balancing access so you can get information with your own independence and a focus on telling the truth. And there's some reporters who do that well, and there's some who don't. And it's very grueling regardless. Well, right. Do people think that Woodward and Bernstein went to, you know, Deep Throat and screamed at him and said, like, how dare you be working for this person? Or, or Mark Feltz, right? Right, exactly. Who was Deep Throat, obviously. Well, I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Same man. But it helps in context of thinking of who he actually was. I mean, it's a strange thing. And I think that for a lot of people, 
I think that they have a focus on the broader world of journalism or with the New York Times. And not unlike Donald Trump, I became a symbol for that in their heads when it really isn't about me. And the news serving people's own biases as opposed to serving the fact pattern. That's right. And I think one of the challenges in news coverage, Tim, in the post-Trump presidency world, but I don't want to say post-Trump world because we're just not there yet, is recognizing and making clear to readers and viewers that Trump is just singular in terms of the abuse of the Justice Department, the expectation of weaponizing government, the constant crisis, chaos. Disdain for rules and laws. Yes, and behavior as if systems shouldn't apply to him, but to also cover the people who are in power, because we have to do that. And so to that point in particular about people wanting news that confirms their biases, I just think that that's an ongoing challenge in the realm of media now. Full disclosure for our listeners, I wrote a biography, Trump Nation, that the former (laughs) president unsuccessfully sued me for. And I felt there was little I could learn that was new or revealing about Trump. But I discovered plenty of that in your book. And I wanted to ask you, what surprised you most about what you uncovered in your book, In Confidence Man? How hard was it to write your book and to pull all of that together? It was brutal. I didn't really turn to this project in earnest until after Trump's second Senate impeachment trial ended. So that was February 2021. I basically had a year. And during that year, Trump was not going away. The investigations into January 6th were just getting underway. And I was trying to do this sort of bigger thematic story. And the presidency has been extremely well covered in terms of volume. But there was a lot gone over. What surprised me it shouldn't, it didn't, well, let me rephrase that. It didn't surprise me, but what surprised me was how available the evidence was of just how this kind of man of few moves had been going through the exact same patterns <laughs> since the late 1970s on all fronts, Tam, in terms and, of- And that those few moves served him well for decades. Because people were sort of mesmerized by him. You know, one of the other things that I tried to explore in the book, and this hasn't gotten as much attention as I thought it would, just given who we're talking about, but I tried to trace how significant Roger Stone has been in Trump's life. Roger Stone, this protege of Roy Cohn, the legendary New York legal fixer. Legal fixer and also, you know, despicable practitioner of human behavior. And the dark political arts. Yeah, but also was simultaneously, you know, and in this way, he really was a model for Trump more than he was for Stone, but kind of navigating the worlds of sort of acceptable society while also playing around in the dirt and the mud and the muck. And, and, and Trump, you know, Trump has always been attracted to people like that because he 100%. thinks that's how you get things done by going in and breaking things and breaking the rules and breaking people's spirit. It's the only way to do it. There's a line in Wayne Barrett's book that I didn't use in the body of my book, but I was really struck by it. And it was kind of an organizing thought as I was doing the book. But he quoted on background a friend. And I have a guess who the friend is, but I'm not going to say who it is here because I hate when people do that. You can tell me about it. I'll tell you later. But um, but saying that I'm paraphrasing, but it was Donald doesn't like to do anything unless there's a little moral larceny to it. And I think that that really accurately describes how Trump goes about things. It's just this sort of delight in seeing how far he can go, what he can get away with, how far he can push you, someone else. Is he selling you? Is he getting you to do what he wants? You mentioned uh, Wayne Barrett earlier. I will use this moment for both of us to tip our hats to Wayne. I was a researcher on his biography of Trump, which was a foundational Trump book, and you intersected with him as well. So RIP Wayne Barrett. And with with deep gratitude. So what fault lines from Trump's past and present and future do you see playing out now within the Republican Party? It's a really good question. And I think that the way that this current House GOP is constituted and the way that Kevin McCarthy governs it are going to be very revealing about what 2024 will bring. You know, one fault line is obviously personal fealty to Donald Trump versus not. And I think that He, since he announced his third presidential campaign in November of 2021, 22, sorry, has been a little surprised that he's not just snapping his fingers and everyone's snapping to support him. So I think that's going to be one. I think the fault line is, does Trumpism continue with Trump or without Trump? 
I think another fault line is going to be, obviously, in the more immediate term, the death ceiling fight. Whether you see Kevin McCarthy hold his coalition together, whether you see him forge a private deal with President Biden, which I think that this group of flamethrowers whose support McCarthy groveled for are going to do everything they can to try to prevent him from going along with. You know, this debt ceiling fight, you know, the, the fight in 2011 was very real when President Obama was in office. And actually, it was Joe Biden who ended up playing a key role. But it was a negotiation with his former Senate colleagues. So maybe you'll see the Senate GOP come in. Maybe it will be Biden and McConnell again. And, you know, one of the breaking forces back then was that voters, once they recognized the kind of economic damage that could be visited upon the U.S. by playing with fire around the national debt, basically forced the GOP to back off. That's exactly right. It's just very hard to see that pressure point coming into play right now. Now, maybe it will down the road as we get closer. D difficult to see because voters now are disposed towards the idea of the value of a federal government in a different way? Correct. I think that you have seen over the course of a decade just a certain disdain for government that is different than the distrust. And that was really what we started seeing over the course of the last three decades in which Donald Trump has exploited and fueled and capitalized on more than any other politician that I can think of. But it has turned from distrust to just disdain and disliking all politicians in a very different way. And I'm not really sure where the pressure points are going to come. So those are where I see the fault lines within the GOP. You know, and then there's another, which is the Senate GOP is such a different animal than the House GOP has been for a long time, but particularly right now. In terms of classic republicanism versus contemporary? Correct. And in terms of McConnell's strength as a leader, right? I mean, like McConnell has really been able, despite just a constant barrage of assaults by Trump, to hold his place and to generally keep his members in line, but not completely. There was a vote to try to get rid of him. And that would not have happened, you know, even a couple of years ago. So that to me, too, is a Donald Trump data point where Trump, as you know, just kind of chips. Up. He's not strategic, but he's like a machine that just keeps coming at you. And he chips away and chips away and chips away. And I think you are seeing some of that with McConnell. So how he fares is also, I think, an open question. Let's drill down on this a little bit more, because Trump is certainly a disruptor. We both noted it. That's why he's the subject of this particular episode. But Trump and I think his political traction are also the products of decades yes. of stresses and strains in the American fabric. And let's talk a little bit about that. You know, the shrinking of the middle class, the tremors of globalization, racism, anti-institutionalism, and the social media boom that all of these things sort of gelled, didn't they, around him at a particular moment in time? 100%, and those are themes that I explore in the book as well, just sort of the idea that this concept of the breaking of America, which is the subtitle of the book, did not happen overnight and did not happen exclusively with Donald Trump. This has been going on for decades, dating back to polarization in Washington that hit what seemed at the time like a critical peak in the 1990s, followed by a series of national traumas, the 2000 election being decided at the Supreme Court, the 2001 terrorist attacks. And then I think that people misunderstand or at least don't fully appreciate or wait. And because history takes forever to get written, it's going to take a long time. But just the impact of the post 9-11 foreign policy and domestic policy behaviors in this country had on our electoral patterns. We are still contending with it. And so... And the 08 crisis, the sort of breaking of aspiration and well-being for the working class and America's working class. And it all congealed. It all came together. And a black president. Correct. And a black pre the first black president getting elected. And so you have all of those forces. And from that muck of emotion comes the Tea Party. And then from the Tea Party comes Donald Trump. There is no Donald Trump without the Tea Party. You know, I know that there's a theory that there's no Donald Trump without Sarah Palin. I don't agree with that. I think Sarah Palin was an avatar for what the country might accept. But Donald Trump had been a celebrity for many decades before. For Sarah sure. Palin was she was a scene. precursor, but she didn't open the door. Correct. She was not a groundbreaker. And so I think that ground was breaking regardless. And so those are the forces that we have seen a fair amount of the Trump energy was capitalizing on these Tea Party forces, at least some of which was driven by a backlash to the election of the first black president. And Trump has been tilling the soil of racial animus and racial paranoia for decades. And New York City was a perfect crucible for that. So what did Trump teach the Republican Party? So mainly when I think about that question, what comes to mind is 
Donald Trump Jr., you know, tweeting about how his dad had taught people to fight back. Whatever the hell fight back means. Right? And, and remember, this is a billionaire talking about, right, right. you know, a purported billionaire talking about how he needs to fight back, even though his life had been cushioned by family wealth, celebrity, and then the powers of high political office. Right. And Trump is expert, as you know well, at making himself the victim to the point where he actually said that in his kickoff speech in November 2022, which I was really surprised by. But he said, I'm a victim. Let me tell you, I'm a victim. And I'm a spokesman for the victimized. Right. But it's also in the past, again, because so much of Trump is just kind of moving in gradations to push the boundary. I've never heard him say prior to that, I'm a victim. That was always the implied message. But now it's just all being said out loud. So I think what he taught the GOP is that you can behave in certain ways. And as long as you don't get criminally charged, the consequences are relative. And so I think that generally to me is Trump's outlook, is get away with what you can. Criminal charges are the real threat. And you're really seeing that tension play out right now, obviously, as he's facing a number of investigations at the criminal level. You know, when you talk about him describing himself as a victim, he's essentially an expert in performance art. You know, he is not a sophisticated man. He's ignorant about a lot of things. And I sort of wonder if the Republican Party, by seeing how effective performance art is as a path to power, is now content to substitute performance art for policymaking. I think that's definitely true. But I will say again, as we talk about the forces that predated Donald Trump, that did predate Donald Trump. He's just an expert at it, to your point. But, you know, this era of sort of Republican lawmakers, you know, existing to get on Fox News has been going on for a very long time. This is not something that Donald Trump brought into being. It's just something that he intensified and amplified and used to his advantage in a way that we had not seen on the national stage before. And remember, he was often at odds with Fox News, but certainly... That is where I think Sarah Palin was a blinking light. Well, and if we're really going to, you know, Father Coughlin was a blinking light with radio and Joe McCarthy with TV, right? There's a long tradition of this in American political life. Correct. But I think that you have not seen such a combination of celebrity and media megaphone and social media megaphone as we have seen with Trump. I think that's the difference. So what can we expect as Trumpism continues to take root in national politics and the GOP? When we get back from the short break, we'll talk about all of that with Maggie Haberman. And we're back. Maggie, let's define Trumpism. We may define it differently, but since we've used it a couple of times in this episode, how do you define Trumpism? It's a really good question. And it's unfortunately something that I think is often shifting. But I think that at its core, it is race-based populism and grievance with sort of a loosely applied ideological through line that often, (laughs) I say loosely because it often changes. You know, it's basically defined by who you hate and who hates you back. And that can change depending on, you know, what we're talking about. But again, that's also something that predates. That's also a sad commentary about all of us, that it gets traction because of that dynamic. But it works, right. And so it does work. Yeah. So that's my idea of Trumpism. But I do think it's important. And I was thinking about this when you were introducing the commercial break. One of the struggles, and this also applies to the question of sort of the stress points in the GOP, it's the stress point within and outside the GOP, is, is Trump the branch or the root? And so I think there have been a lot of Republicans who don't like him and Democrats who certainly don't like him, who have argued, you know, if you just get rid of Trump, he's the problem. He's not the problem. He is now the symbol of, quote unquote, the problem. And he's the symbol of a philosophy. I mean, I think I think, that's right. I think I agree with you about how you define Trumpism. I would throw into the mix anti-globalism, totally. anti-institutionalism. And that's the loose ideology that I'm referring to. Right. Right. This escalating war with corporate America and with, quote unquote, elites. Yep. Right. And that dialogue works, Right. Well, there's a look. And to your point about going back to the days of Father Coughlin, there's a long market for that, too. It's not like anti-institutionalism just suddenly came up. It's just that anti-institutionalism sentiment rises as you're seeing trust in institutions go like this. And Trump is against institutions for his own reasons. They're not doing things that he wants for him. It's not actually about these people he's claiming to 
be fighting this fight for, but they see him as their fighter. And that is where, when I say he's not the problem, I want to amend what I said. You know, he he's is a reflection. A, he is a reflection and he is, an, he is a force that I think that the country is going to be dealing with for a very, very long time. But I don't think that the situation is such that if Trump is somehow not on the political scene anymore, that life goes back to 2000. That's not happening. And I think there are a lot of people who are still waiting for that moment. And it's like when when Biden would talk about the fever is going to break. The fever is not breaking. Right. Goodbye to all of that. Right. And, you know, the idea that they are out to get you, there's someone out there in some form who's out to get you. They may exist in politics or in business or it may be your neighbor or it may be that immigrant, maybe that black person down the street or that yellow person in San Francisco. Someone is out to get you and you better beware is been a very effective anchor for authoritarian governments everywhere. And it has been a driving force of the Trump family for a very long time, as you know better than anybody, too. And which we've talked about because, you know, Fred Trump, who was sort of exiled from the public housing market for illegalities, the family told itself that he lost his business traction because the government was out to get Fred. That's right. That's right. You know, I can't think of a more Rorschach moment for where the Republican Party resides right now than the recent battle in the House of Representatives over the speakership. And that's obviously a collision of now the Republican Party with itself, this extremist wing of, I think, flamethrowers and the more traditional wing of the party that believes in lower taxes, a conservative court and a hawkish foreign policy. What do you see in all of that? I see it, frankly, less as a sort of a clash of governing ideologies than I do of just, you know, sort of this flamethrower versus non-flamethrower without necessarily having a cause. I think once upon a time in the early iterations of the Tea Party and then the House Freedom Caucus that emerged from the Tea Party, it was much more about budget balance. But, you know, Paul Ryan was all about budget balance and Paul Ryan is seen as a Democrat by Trump forces, right? So And a sellout. Well, yes. But I also think that although those are also people who would sell out to Trump directly, if that would help them. <laughs> That's true. I think that it's very hard to find the lines along which this breaks down at this point. But I don't think it's about strict policy. Well, though, I do think I mean, I think if there's an animating thing, it's again, this anti-government stance that you I do whatever you can to sort of burn down the federal government because it's only a suffocating and inhibiting force. It gets in the way of individual freedom. I agree with that. But I also think that because that is such a diffuse concept that can be sublimated depending on the moment. And frankly, sublimating an existing supposed core belief in service of something else is also a key factor of Trumpism, as you know, and certainly how Trump behaves. So how do you see, I mean, this came to light right after the midterm, the fight over the speakership happens right after midterm elections that didn't go nearly as swimmingly as Republicans expected. The abortion issue had traction in a way I think Republicans didn't expect. The inflation issue didn't have as much traction with voters as I think they thought it would. So how does that play out? You know, where do Republicans go from here? And what happens to some of their bread and butter policy issues? It's a good question. I mean, part of how these elections in the midterms were fought was that because of gerrymandering, because of shifts in the media, because of the changes in the political landscapes, elections have become more and more national over the course of the last, you know, decade, decade and a half. And I think that that was one of the misreads, certainly for Republicans, but also I would say in New York for Democrats too, that crime and not talking about crime was impactful for Democrats in a state where... In, pretty, in the state of New York. Yeah, in the state of New York, where Hochul, the governor, talked a lot about abortion, but that was less animating for a lot of voters in a state where the abortion laws are unlikely to change, at least anytime soon. So for Republicans, I think that they were fighting on a number of different fronts, sort of classic anti-incumbent fronts against Biden, who is just very hard to demonize and make unlikable the same way as other candidates. It's pretty clear, even though Biden's approval ratings are not great, that voters don't get riled up by him the way they do by Trump and scared by him the way they do by Trump. And Trump also supported a lot of candidates who were viewed by voters as deeply problematic and concerning. And so, you know, when I look at where Republicans went wrong, 
candidate quality is a big piece of it. And allowing Trump to play a role in boosting certain candidates over others that might have been more electable Republicans. Well, I don't know how much of it's allowing, because that gets to your point about the future of the Republican Party. A big point is, yes, he is a fading commodity within the GOP, but he's not faded. He just doesn't have the backing that he had. He is still getting more support. I mean, I, you know, I've seen these snap polls that show Ron DeSantis ahead of Trump by a huge mile. The more reliable polls show that Trump has still got a plurality of support. By a comfortable mass of percentage points. Correct. And so, you know, I don't know how much of it's allowing versus he has huge influence with the voters they need. And so that's the dilemma that they have been in since 2015. And that's the dilemma they're going to find themselves in for a long time. Do you see the GOP down the road rallying around other people, you know, sort of Trump wannabes in better suits like DeSantis or Hawley or shape-shifting Trump wannabes like Elise Stefanik or Ted Cruz? Or is there going to be a move away from flamethrowing to more structural conservatism? I don't think there's going to be a move away from flamethrowing anytime soon. I think that will require Donald Trump not being on the political scene anymore. The risk-reward calculus has to be different for these electeds than what it is right now. So everybody better put on their asbestos. 2024 is going to be a very, we have seen since 2016, 2016 was a very, very, very rough election, both in terms of how Trump went after his Republican rivals and then how he went after Hillary Clinton, which was savage. And 2020 made 2024 look like a high-minded debate of ideals. And the only thing that was slightly leavening on that was the fact that there was a global pandemic. But 2024 is going to be the first really post-pandemic election, although we're still in the pandemic, but you know what I mean in terms of pandemic restrictions. 2022 was mostly that, but this is going to be different. And I just think that it's going to go to a very dark place, whether Donald Trump is the nominee or not, because look at the factors that we're looking at right now, Tim. I feel like so much of the political analysis of what the 2024 Republican primary is going to look like ignores the fact that the guy is facing four criminal investigations, two DOJ, one Georgia, one in Manhattan now, another one with Alvin Bragg, that's actually in some ways the simplest. Involving an array of possible crimes from voting fraud to financial fraud to violations of the Espionage Act to inciting an insurrection and overthrowing the government. Yeah, I mean, it's mind blowing. And so we don't know what that's all going to look like. We don't know what effect if he gets indicted, any of that will have on the Republican Party. You know, I mean, if this had been eight years ago, you couldn't have an indicted front runner. With two impeachments, by the way. Right. I don't think we're there right now. The known unknowns, as has been said, are so many that it's very hard to predict where this Republican Party heads because Trump is going to demand, if he gets indicted, he is going to demand, fight for me. They are wronging me. And a lot of Republican candidates who would oppose him are going to be hard pressed to walk a line where they're going to, most of them agree with him because that's how this party is now structurally built, but then try to separate themselves from him and explain why he, it's going to be very strange to watch. The big question, how should we think about contemporary conservatism and the GOP amid the human tornado that is Donald Trump? And what does this mean for Democrats? Let's take one more break, and then I want to dive into more of this with Maggie Haberman. So, Mags, the Democrats have always struggled with party unity themselves. And Biden, for all of his faults, he's a kind of cringeworthy public speaker, He can ramble on, but he has been able to sort of keep a fractious party tethered on a common set of goals thus far, hasn't he? He has, although I would argue that he has had some help that I think gets overlooked in the form of Nancy Pelosi up until now and Chuck Schumer. And I think whatever people think of both of them when Trump was in power, particularly Schumer, as a leader, I think that Pelosi was very effective over a very long period of time. I think that Schumer is seen by a lot of Democrats is having grown into that role. And I think that has benefited Biden. And she was masterful at keeping the Democratic caucus together in the House. She was a unique figure. And I think that is going to only become clearer over time. You know, we've talked about Trump colliding with the GOP and the GOP colliding with itself. What do you think Trump's arrival and Trumpism has meant for Democrats and the sort of deepening polarization between the parties? 
you know, look, I think that Trump and Trumpism were incredibly helpful to Biden in getting elected in 2020. I think that a lot of the approach toward the presidency, I mean, the, Biden has been and his aides have been very overt about this, which is he's not Trump. I'm not that. Now, I don't know that people necessarily want the standard in public life to be not being as bad as Trump. I don't know that that's a good norm for the U.S., <laughs> but it's certainly where we are for right now. You're better than the alternative. Right. Well, I mean, look, all the politics is you're better than the alternative. The thing is, is if in perpetuity, it's it's not actually about the alternative. It's just about Trump. And it's not about what you can offer, why you're better and what your vision is. You know, like I said, it was very effective for Biden for 2020. Biden in a reelect is going to have a lot of things that he can point to. He's obviously got a problem right now in terms of, you know, the White House statements related to the documents that have been found at his house and at the the Penn Biden Center, which I just want to say off the bat, the circumstances that we know of so far are not remotely comparable to what we know of with Trump and documents. Trump defied requests to return the documents, the subpoenas. He took 13 boxes of documents to his private residence. Look, it's not uncommon that the archive spends time trying to get stuff back after presidents leave. What is uncommon is not returning it. And I certainly don't understand the volume of classified material that he had. But yes, to your point, there was a subpoena and then a statement that everything had been returned. And then when that turned out not to be true, there was a search warrant. And none of that has been the case with Biden. And and a possible obstruction of justice on Trump's side of the ledger. Nonetheless, this is an issue for Biden. It's an issue for Biden. I don't know how much voters care. I really don't. I mean, I don't know how much of this actually impacts anyone. I think that the White House has generally taken the the stand, or at least the president has, that he's not going to give in to reporters asking for more on this. That really is generally how they handled the 2020 campaign, and it worked for them. I don't know whether that's going to be sustainable with this. It just depends on whether anything more comes out. But all of that is to say... Just, that- just one other thing, though, too, Mags, is that Biden's also going to be confronted now by a House that's controlled by Republicans. Well, that is true. And they're going to launch volleys of investigations at him and his administration, which is another thing he's got to contend with. And his son. And so, I mean, I think it's very, very complicated in that respect. And navigating those investigations can be hard. They do have the Democrats some help in the fact that Republicans have shown difficulty both getting on the same page and you know, executing things competently. But I think you can't count on your opponent. And this is kind of my point about Trump or part of it. You can't count on your opponent blowing themselves up all the time. And so that runs out, that tether. And your opponent being a singular narcissist and sort of unhinged, deeply insecure person. All of the things that gave Trump momentum are also some of the things that are dragging him down now and are things that other candidates don't bring to the table. And while you've certainly seen Kevin McCarthy give into that insecurity, he's made a big point of saying, oh, Trump was invaluable in getting me support for the speakership. I mean, that's clearly not true because Trump endorsed him and it didn't move votes for many days. But Trump did, it seems, play some minor role at the very last minute, right before the 15th ballot when McCarthy was given the speakership. But in terms of how Democrats have cohesed, if you look at where the party was in 2013 or 2011 to now, Democrats have moved on a number of issues. The party itself has moved to the left. I actually think that what part of what Biden navigated very effectively in 2020 was both wings. Fear of Trump has been a unifying force for both wings. I just don't know that that's going to last the same way. And Biden's going to be 82 or almost 82 when the next presidential election rolls around in 2024. How are senior leaders and strategists within the Democratic Party thinking about that? So, you know, I mean, look, it depends on what group of people you're talking to. I'm always concerned about the formulation of, you know, the senior leaders and strategists because it always makes people reiterates the, the hope for people that there's some group in the corner behind the curtain and they're making the decisions. And that's not, as we know, how either party works. But there are a number of people who either are close to other potential candidates or a newer generation of leadership, or even people who are close to this White House who are concerned about Biden's age. The White House does not like that conversation. You know, I have had several Democrats insist to me it's a very, very unfair conversation. It's something that voters are aware of and can see on their own. It's not as if this idea is being suggested to them. So, you know, it is something they're concerned about. Does that mean they settle on a different standard bearer for the party? I think the only way that happens is if Biden says he's not running, and I see no indication of that right now. It's so rare, as you know, that somebody wins a term and then says, you know, I'm done. 
And so, you know, Biden, I was thinking about this the other day, Biden and Trump were looking one obviously much more seriously than the other at presidential campaigns. One actually declared one not. But in 1987, Biden, I think, withdrew his candidacy the month before Trump took his trip to New Hampshire. Oh, wow. That's such an interesting observation. (laughs) Yeah. And so these are two people who have been, you know, circling this particular basin for a long time. Yeah. And so, you know, Biden finally won and he's actually been seen by non-hardcore Republicans as a pretty effective president. So why would he decide he's not going to run? I just don't see it. Maggie, I always like to ask guests what they learn along the way around this particular topic we're discussing. And I'm wondering what, when you think about it, what has been your core takeaway? What have you learned from Trump's collision with the GOP? What I have learned from the collision with the GOP is that, and I write about this in the book, Trump basically showed that Republicans in Washington were as craven as he said they were. They all opposed him. I'm not saying that they're the only politicians who are craven in terms of you know their calculations, but everyone opposed him to varying degrees. And for the most part, people made concessions either because they had to work with him because he was the leader of the party, or at least that's what they told themselves, and that was the rationalization. The willingness to go along with power, despite claiming to be anti-government, has been a defining theme of Republicans in Congress during the Trump years. That's what I feel like I have learned. Wow. 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 We're already out of time. Thanks for joining us, Maggie. Yes. (laughs) We have more to talk about. You can follow Maggie Haberman on Twitter at Maggie NYT, read her work at The New York Times, and buy her invaluable Trump biography, Confidence Man at your local bookstore or online. Thanks, Maggie. Thanks, Tim. Here at Crash Course, we believe that collisions can be messy, impressive, challenging, surprising, and always instructive. In today's Crash Course, I learned that our political landscape is so deeply in flames that all of us may need to strap on a bunch of asbestos to get through it. It's not an optimistic lesson, but that seems to be the case. What did you learn? We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at the Bloomberg Opinion handle, at Opinion, or me, at Tim O'Brien, using the hashtag Bloomberg Crash Course. You can also subscribe to our show wherever you're listening right now and leave us a review. It helps more people find the show. This episode was produced by the indispensable Anna Mazarakis and me. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen, and we had editing help from Katie Boyce, Jeff Grocott, Mike Nietzsche, and Christine Vanden Bylart. Blake Maples does our sound engineering, and our original theme song was composed by Luis Guerra. I'm Tim O'Brien. We'll be back next week with another Crash Course. <laughs>